Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is Introduction to Myeloid Neoplasms. I would recommend that you watch the Introduction to Lymphoid Neoplasms and the video on Hodgkin Lymphoma before you watch this one. In this video, I will be reviewing the basic features of myeloid neoplasms. Now, this uh, slide should look familiar. It is the different types of hematopoietic neoplasms. In this video, we'll be focusing on the uh, lesions of hematopoietic cells. These are further classified as acute myeloid leukemias, myelodysplastic syndromes, and myeloproliferative neoplasms. In our acute myeloid leukemias, or AMLs, we have acquired mutations that impede differentiation. These are classically defined as having at least 20% blasts, but I'll explain why this is in quotation marks in a little bit. We also have myelodysplastic syndromes, or MDS, in which we have ineffective hematopoiesis that can lead to peripheral cytopenias. And finally, we have the myeloproliferative neoplasms, or MPN, in which we have increases in terminally differentiated myeloid elements, leading to increases in our peripheral blood counts. So here you can see our types of hematopoietic neoplasms. It's about to get a lot more complicated as we focus on our AML. And why is this? Well, it has to do with the complicated elements of hematopoiesis. So we begin here with our totipotent uh, hematopoietic stem cell that's going to then become uh, this uh, pluripotent myeloid stem cell from which it can then differentiate along a variety of different lineages, eventually ending up with our macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, etc. But along the way, there are many stops. So we have our colony forming units, our myeloblasts, our promyelocytes, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, and our final product. And when you consider that we can get transformation uh, in many of these different cell types, you can see why diagnosis and classification is so complicated. So this is a heterogeneous uh, group of uh, neoplasms of hematopoietic progenitor cells. They primarily will involve the bone marrow, and the symptoms are related to altered hematopoiesis. The presentation will depend on which type of uh, myeloid neoplasm you have. So acute myeloid leukemias, like acute lymphocytic leukemias, have abundant uh, blasts in the bone marrow, which is going to impede normal hematopoiesis, leading to pancytopenias. By contrast, in myelodysplastic syndrome, we have defective maturation. So while we do get some hematopoiesis, it's ineffective, again, leading to cytopenias. But on the other hand, for our myeloproliferative neoplasms, the lesion here will be a mutation that confers uh, independence from growth factors. So we will have not a cytopenia, but increased production of one or more types of blood cells. So for example, depending on which cell is involved, uh, you can get different symptoms. So for polycythemia vera, you'll have a significant increase in the hematocrit. Let's begin with the acute myeloid leukemias. So these can affect any age, but most patients are greater than 60 years old. Uh, these will often arise from a pre-existing myeloid neoplasm, such as a myeloproliferative neoplasm or myelodysplastic syndrome. And as I mentioned, they're characterized by marrow failure, leading to pancytopenias. Uh, some uh, subtypes of myeloid leukemias can release thromboplastic substances, resulting in disseminated intravascular coagulation. And uh, traditionally, the diagnosis has required uh, the uh, identification of at least 20% blasts uh, for all subtypes. Uh, however, uh, that is uh, perhaps uh, changing as the WHO is looking at removing that requirement for certain AMLs with defined genetic aberrations. So more on that in a moment. Now, the uh, AMLs are a very heterogeneous group. How heterogeneous are they? Well, here's a table from Robbins and Cotron, a pathologic basis of disease that uh, I think I memorized when I was a medical student. I would encourage you not to memorize this. I'm going to try to point out uh, the elements that are the most important for you uh, at this point in your career. The way that we've looked at AMLs is to categorize them, categorize them into four classes, AML with genetic aberrations, AML with MDS-like features, AML therapy related, and AML not otherwise specified. Uh, this is undergoing some shifts. So if we look at what the WHO is currently considering, it's actually taking it down to two categories, AML with defining genetic abnormalities and AML defined by differentiation. So uh, ideally, we would find the genetic abnormalities for all of the AML, so we'd really only have one category. 
Now, when we look at these AML defining genetic abnormalities, there are two, one with a BCR able and one that has CEBPA mutations, for which we still need to identify at least 20% blasts, with others simply finding that the fusion uh, is enough to make the diagnosis of AML. We also have our AML defined by differentiation as minimal or without, etc. And uh, prognosis is going and treatment will depend on subtype. So this very complicated uh, set is something that you will learn in greater detail uh, when you're on hematology or if you consider a career as a hematopathologist. So what do you need to know? Well, for your clinical practice, uh, Dr. John Astor, who's one of the co-editors of the Robbins textbooks and one of my colleagues, uh, he's a hematopathologist, and he says it's good to think of this as existing as really two categories. You have AML that's associated with particular chromosomal translocations, and I'll talk about one of those in a moment. Uh, simple genetics, uh, patients are relatively young, and the prognosis is relatively good. On the other hand, you have AML associated with point mutations and or copy number changes uh, with complex genetics, uh, older age uh, of the patient, and these typically will have a very poor outcome and are virtually never curable. And they often will arise uh, from a pre-existing condition, so you're familiar with uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and myeloproliferative uh, neoplasms, but we can also see it in the context of CHIP, which is clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate uh, prognosis, which we'll talk about more in a moment. We can also see this with toxin exposure, for example, chemotherapy. This is one of the reasons why we're very careful uh, with patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, since they can develop a secondary AML when treated with chemotherapy. Uh, one way to think about AMLs is the categories of driver mutations. So we can get mutations in transcription factors that interfere with normal myeloid differentiation. An example of this is the fusion protein PML uh, RARA. More on that in a moment. We can get mutations of signaling peptides so that we can get constitutive pro-growth uh, or survival pathways, for example, with mutated uh, RAS protein. Uh, we can get mutations in proteins that regulate or maintain the epigenome, uh, such as IDH1 and IDH2, uh, which are covered uh, in the neoplasia chapter as well as in the video on gliomas. And the relevant uh, part here is that uh, because these are due to IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, IDH inhibitors can help patients with these mutations uh, go into remission. And then the final uh, category here would be mutations of TP53 or genes that regulate P53. Uh, as you recall, P53 is the guardian of the genome. When that breaks down, we're going to get multiple uh, mutation events leading to complex karyotypes. Uh, cells will show marked dysplasia and patients will have a poor prognosis. The one type of AML that I like to focus on is because it's uh, particularly important and interesting is acute promyelocytic leukemia, which has the 15-17 uh, chromosomal translocation. This translocation results in this fusion protein of PML and RARA. RARA encodes the retinoic acid receptor, and when we get this fusion protein, it will block myeloid differentiation due to decreased function of the retinoic acid receptor. However, if we give high-dose all-transretinoic acid, or ATRA, we can drive uh, towards neutrophilic differentiation. And if we add on arsenic salts, we can get cure in about 90% of patients. Another important feature of acute promyelocytic leukemia with this uh, translocation is that uh, they tend to elaborate procoagulants and fibrinolytic factors, uh, leading to a high incidence of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now, morphologically, um, AMLs are going to look very similar to ALLs. However, we're going to have our rods, which are needle-like structures in the cytoplasm composed of azurophilic granule material, and they're often in bundles. Now, we don't see them in all the AMLs. We do see it in APML. So here you can see an AML that does not have our rods. This looks actually very similar to an ALL. Uh, but what we see here in this APML is these uh, little bundles uh, of rods. This will be uh, your hour rods. Uh, so this brings us to the next topic, which is our myelodysplastic uh, syndromes. So these are clonal stem cell disorders that lead to maturation defects uh, and ineffective hematopoiesis. Uh, these clones are genetically unstable, and there's a high risk of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. Now, while most cases are idiopathic, some are due to carcinogen exposure, uh, previous cancer therapy, or ionizing radiation therapy. And we've already invoked this uh, asymptomatic precursor, or CHIP, uh, and we know this is a precursor because we have identical driver mutations to what we see in MDS. 
uh, and that we get a conversion to an overt white cell neoplasm at a rate of about 1% per year. A uh, CHIP is also uh, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, uh, which is mentioned uh, in the cardiovascular pathology uh, section. So what is the pathogenesis uh, of these? Uh, we have some uh, frequently mutated uh, types of genes, uh, such as epigenetic factors uh, that regulate uh, DNA methylation or histone modification. Uh, we can also see mutations in our RNA splicing factors leading to altered RNA processing and altered function of our oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. Finally, we can see uh, mutations in transcription factors necessary for normal myelopoiesis. And finally, again, loss of function mutations of TP53 are seen in about 10% of these uh, cases, leading again to our complex karyotype and associated with a poor clinical outcome. So the pathophysiology here is that we have ineffective hematopoiesis and the bone marrow will be replaced by these clonal cells. The neoplastic cells can still differentiate to red cells, granulocytes, platelets, etc., but the differentiation is ineffective and disordered. Typically, uh, the bone marrow will be hypercellular, though we can also see normocellular or hypocellular bone marrow as well. And we can identify certain features of these dysplastic cells on uh, bone marrow biopsy. So we can see uh, ring sideroblasts, which are erythroblasts with iron-laden mitochondria. We have megaloblastoid erythroid precursors, so much larger erythroid precursors, similar to what we see in folate and vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, we can see granulocytes with atypical granules and neutrophils that are hypolobated with only two nuclear lobes. The peripheral blood uh, will show uh, one or more cytopenias, uh, and patients will typically present with weakness or infections or hemorrhage due to these cytopenias, although about 50% of patients, uh, this will be an incidental finding. Here are some of the findings we can see morphologically. These are atypical uh, erythroblasts. Uh, they don't have their, uh, their typical morphology. We have this lobate uh, nucleus. Here is a ringed sideroblast where you can see these little iron-containing uh, mitochondria. Uh, these are neutrophils that only have two lobes, and this is a megakaryocyte uh, with three separate nuclei, so very atypical. Uh, clinically, our primary MDS uh, tends to arise in patients aged 50 to 70. There are about 15,000 uh, cases per year in the United States. There's a poor response to chemotherapy, and about 10 to 40 percent of cases will transform to AML, uh, which of course is associated with a poor prognosis. The prognosis of myelodysplastic syndromes is variable. Uh, survival tends to be 9 to 29 months, with decreased survival when you have increasing marrow blasts, uh, multiple cytogenetic abnormalities, and TP53 mutations. This brings us to the last category, which is our myeloproliferative neoplasms. So in this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to get growth factor independence. Uh, this can uh, come through two different uh, pathways. One is through uh, mutation uh, to yield constitutively active tyrosine kinases, or we can get acquired aberrations in our signaling pathways. Now, we're going to have growth factor independence, but our differentiation will be normal. So we're going to get increased production of mature blood elements. Now, most myeloproliferative neoplasms will arise in multipotent myeloid progenitors, but some can even arise in our pluripotent uh, stem cells, uh, and we get both lymphoid and myeloid cells. The common features of our myeloproliferative neoplasms is that we have this increased proliferative drive in the bone marrow, and because of this increased drive, we're going to get extra medullary hematopoiesis, where our neoplastic cells will home to secondary hematopoietic organs, such as the spleen, the liver, the lymph nodes. We can get variable transformation to a spent phase uh, that results in marrow fibrosis and peripheral blood cytopenias, and variable transformation to acute leukemia. So the pathogenesis of myeloproliferative uh, neoplasms is very interesting. So we basically have two categories. We have these top three, which are categorized uh, by some sort of defect in uh, JAK uh, stat signaling, and then we have chronic myeloid leukemia, which is due to our bcr able fusion protein. So when we look at these three, polycythemia vera, which has an increase in red cells, although also granulocytes and platelets, this is due to activating mutations in JAK2 tyrosine kinase. Essential thrombocytosis, which has increased platelet counts, is also due to increased JAK stat signaling. And we see increased JAK stat signaling as well as in primary myelofibrosis, which is categorized by obliterative uh, marrow fibrosis. 
Uh, in uh, this last uh, instance, we have the JAK-STAT signaling is going to cause the release of fibrogenic factors from neoplastic megakaryocytes. So what we're seeing is that depending on which uh, type of pluripotent uh, or particular uh, uh, immature cell is affected by this mutation, we can get different manifestations. Now, we don't talk about JAK-STAT very much, so I'm going to show you a little bit more about this on the next slide. But before uh, we move into that, let me just tell you that JAK is a receptor-associated kinase, and STAT is a cytoplasmic protein. Uh, STAT stands for signal transducers and activators of transcription. So we'll go over that in a moment. Uh, the last one will be our chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML, in which we get increased mature and maturing granulocytes, mostly neutrophils, and we'll talk about uh, BCR able fusion uh, protein in a moment. But first, let's look at our JAK uh, STAT signaling. This is a, a figure I created myself. Uh, where we have here our receptor, and this is the, uh, uh, the kinase that is associated with this uh, particular receptor. When we get binding of the ligand, STAT is going to uh, translocate from being loose in the cytoplasm to binding to JAK, which will then phosphorylate it. Phosphorylated STAT can then dimerize with another phosphorylated STAT, translocate to the nucleus, and activate our target genes. So this is what we see in those three entities. Now let's uh, focus on chronic myeloid leukemia and its clinical features. This uh, can affect primarily adults, but also children and adolescents. There are about 4,500 cases per year in the United States. Patients will typically present with fatigue or weakness, uh, but they can also have a dragging sensation in the abdomen due to the massive splenomegaly they can experience. And the uh, incredible size of the spleen can lead to splenic infarcts, uh, so that might uh, cause acute onset uh, left upper quadrant pain. Uh, the pathogenesis of chronic myeloid leukemia is related directly to our BCR able fusion uh, protein, which is a constitutively active tyrosine kinase. BCR moiety will self associate into dimers activating ABL, which will phosphorylate signal inducing proteins. This will lead us down uh, pro growth, pro survival pathways that are typically induced by hematopoietic growth factors like RAS and STAT. Here is a figure from Robbins and Cotron, basic, uh, sorry, pathologic basis of disease, where you can see uh, the translocation, the fusion mRNA, the fusion protein. The uh, uh, BCR part here is going to dimerize, thereby activating uh, our ABL portion, and it's going to activate these pathways that are typically part of the RAS, STAT, and AKT pathways. So what is the effect of the BCR able fusion? Uh, the transformed hematopoietic stem cell is going to generate granulocytic, erythroid, megakaryocytic, and B-cell precursors, rarely uh, T-cell precursors. Uh, we're usually going to see a really massively increased leukocyte count in the peripheral blood with more than 100,000 cells per microliter, mostly neutrophils, but also immature granulocytic precursors. The uh, bone marrow will be hypercellular, and as I mentioned, we can see a really quite remarkable extramedullary hematopoiesis. Prognosis depends on treatment. So with untreated disease, there is slow progression uh, over about three years, at which point about 50% of patients will enter an accelerated phase with increasing anemia and thrombocytopenia that will then evolve over six to 12 months to a blast crisis, so an acute leukemia. The other 50% can progress to blast crisis without an accelerated phase. These blasts uh, are going to be myeloid about 70% of the time, or pre-B cell origin lymphoid uh, about 30% of the time. So this tells us a little bit about uh, how uh, immature the uh, initial transformed cell is. Now with treatment, we have a lot of hope we can offer patients. We can give them tyrosine kinase inhibitors that can drive them into a sustained uh, remission. Uh, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors have minimal toxicity and will also decrease progression to blast crisis. However, over time, uh, the tumors can develop resistance uh, to tyrosine kinase inhibitors with additional mutations. So we're now using second and third line medications. Some patients uh, also uh, are eligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, so uh, I'd like to finish here with a table uh, from Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology just to help you uh, put this together uh, and what we uh, can see as far as mutations go. And uh, as always, I'd like to uh, finish uh, with uh, a few questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, I hope you find this useful.